I have a question. What's the question? Is this your first time speaking at DEF CON? It is. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so actually, I wanted to say that we were, we were experimenting with something new this year at DEF CON. Yeah, could you set us up, please? We were looking for a, uh, a drone delivery system. <laughs> what is that? What is this? <laughs> what do you think? Will that deliver shots? Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's cool. You all know how this works. You've been here long enough. Okay. Wait, slow yeah, down there, man. Whoa. Well, all right. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. And now back to our regularly scheduled talk. Oh. So, I feel a bit warmer. Okay. So, I was saying, uh, let's see how the usual exploitation process takes place. So, if you're an exploiter, you're trying to exploit something, usually, first of all, you have to find a vulnerability. And this vulnerability has to be useful. And by useful means, I mean that you have to be able to basically di divert the control flow of the program to some address you, you want. And once you, you di you do, you're able to do this, then you can perform your des desired actions, like, I don't know, invoking the system, the system library function and execv or launching program, copying wallets, I mean, doing the actual, uh, your actual final aim. And our, this talk, our the focus is in this, on this last part. So we are assuming we are able to divert the control flow, and then we'll see what can we do afterwards. And in particular, we'll see uh, how can we do this last part of the exploitation process in presence of uh, certain countermeasures that I'll present. Because just being able to divert execution is not enough. Because okay, I can, you know, I have my, I have control of the program counter, but the question now is where do I point it to? The, the where it's the important thing, and since it's 2015, we cannot, you know, upload a shell code in our target and just jump there because operating system, system are preventing this kind of stuff. So, as you all know, uh, hackers and you know exploiters came up with the the concept of code reuse attack. So we cannot uh, upload or you know in inject new code, and then what we do? We reuse existing code. So we, ca we came up with the famous, you know, returning to libc attack, and then all the return programming, return-oriented programming, which I hope you are a bit, at least a bit familiar with. The problem is that okay, we are able still to perform our attack, even in, in, uh, if we are not able to inject a new shell code we're using code. But the problem is that uh, you know, the operating system developers came up with a countermeasure, which is called ASLR, which basically means that it's other space layout randomization which means that uh, basically the code that you want to reuse, for instance, uh, the uh, system library functions and those kind of functions, uh, are not always in the same position. Their position is not deterministic. So the question, again, is, OK, I can divert the control flow. The code I want to reuse is there, but where it is? So the typical situation to uh, get around the ASLR is, um, is uh, use the functions that are already imported. Because so the main executable uh, uses some, let, let's suppose that the main executable uses some functions for, for instance, the C standard library, like the printf function, which is very common. To, to be able to use this function, it keeps in memory, in the memory area which is the, dedicated to the main binary, a reference to this function, which, which basically holds the address of the, of the printf function. And so the typical uh, way, I was, as I was saying, to bypass ASLR is, okay, let's try to read the address of this printf function, which is actually imported by the main binary, then if we have a copy of the C standard library, if you're targeting the C standard library, let's compute the distance between the printf function and another function we want to execute to do our, to perform our malicious operations, typically system or exact VE. We compute this distance, and then if you are able to get from our target the address of printf, we can add the distance to, you know, to reach exact VE, and then we know the address of exact VE, and then we can you know, uh, call exact VE and perform our, our attack. 
This works, but the problem is that, first of all, it requires, it, you, you don't just have to be able to divert the control flow, but you also have to be able to leak this piece of information, the address of printf, so you, you need at least two vulnerabilities. You need a, a memory leak vulnerability, typically. And also, you need the uh, knowledge about uh, the, the, the layout of the library you're targeting. So you basically need the exact copy, not just the version, you need like the exact copy, so the exact build you know, of the library. Which is not always the which is not always the case. I mean, there are some situations where maybe you don't have access to it. And finally, there's another point which is uh, you know a bit subtle is that you need to interact with the attacker. Okay, so it, it's not a single stage attack. It's not that you just launch your attack and it works. You do your exploitation. You need to communicate back to the attacker. So it basically, you read the printf and then on the attacker side you compute the new address and you send another stage of the exploit. So it's two stage. And this is a problem because maybe if your final target is a um, hair gap machine, for instance, you can't really communicate. Maybe you have a JPG, uh, you are storing your exploit in a JPG or in a PCAP file or something, which is you know, open on an uh, air gap machine, you can't really communicate. So this is a problem. So how can we solve this problem? Let's try to zoom out a bit. Actually, our idea in, um, when we came up with, this, uh, with these techniques it's, let's try, okay, let's try to zoom out a bit. What are we trying to do? Basically, what we're trying to do is to obtain the address of an arbitrary library function. So I have a name, and I want its address. So I'm able to call it. But if you think, well, there is already a part of the operating system doing this job, and it's the dynamic loader. The dynamic loader, basically, the, the role of the dynamic loader is to uh, take the main binary, or even a library, and see what are the imported functions, for instance, printf, and from the name, from the string printf, obtain its address, where, where the printf function actually resides in memory, uh, considering ASLR and everything. So let's try to get to know this guy, the dynamic loader. First of all, uh, I'm going to talk about dynamic loading and everything in the, uh, in the context of ELF-based platform. So ELF, uh, for those who do not that, know that, stands for executable and linking format, and it's basically the most popular uh, format for Unix-based platforms, so Linux or BSD, uh, like FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, they all use uh, ELF, which is a binary format, as I said. And so if we consider an ELF file, like an ELF executable, the first way we can uh, see it, uh, we can split it in sections. So it's a file, and it has several parts with our, which are called sections. The most important uh, sections that you usually deal with, and maybe if you've been doing a bit of uh, reverse engineering, are usually the dot text. All the sections start with a dot. So the dot text section, which holds the executable code, so the actual code, the binary code the, the, of the application. Then we have dot data, which holds all the writable global data. So let's say the global variables that are writable, they're not just read-only. The read-only ones stay in uh, arrow data, which stands for read-only data. And then we have BSS, which is a section which holds global variables which are not initialized. So for instance, if you, like in C, you uh, write a global array that it's not initialized, it will be zero initialized and will, be, will end up in BSS. Okay? So uh, what, let's see what's the role of the dynamic loader. The, 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 basically, the compiler hides uh, a bit of the complexity of the dynamic loader because when we see this piece of code, like a very simple um, a lower program, we see just printf. But what actually the compiler emits, it's not a call to the printf in the C standard library because, the, as I said, the, the, the libraries are positioned in random positions, so you cannot know at compile time where the printf will end up. What actually the compiler does is calling the, the printf at plt which is a, a, a trampoline, uh, so a, let's say a small piece of assembly code that we're gonna see. We're gonna explore how it works. This, this small trampoline is stored in another section which is called .plt, the so-called proce procedure linkage table, which is a table uh, composed by this small trampoline, trampoline one for each uh, imported function. And basically, uh, let's see how it looks like. Uh, so these trampoline are used to uh, support lazy loading. Lazy loading is a feature of the, the several dynamic loaders, basically most of them, which um, allows you, when you start the program, instead of uh, resolving all the important functions, getting the real address at the startup of the program, 
you basically uh, obtain their address the first time you call them. So if there's a function you never call, it, it's not going to be resolved and you're saving time. Okay? And also the startup of the program, it's, it's faster for the end user. So it works a bit like this. This is pseudo code. It's not, it, actually, it's an assembly optimized code. What's the, the trampoline, it doesn't look like this. But let, this is high level stuff to, to make you understand. So if it's the first uh, call, the, the first time that the trampoline is it's being called, uh, the, the, the main binary will, uh, let, uh, will pass the control flow to the dynamic loader, calling this DL runtime resolve function which we'll explore in a bit. Otherwise, it will just jump to the, uh, uh, the cached version of these, uh, these functions. For instance, if this is the trampoline of printf, uh, there will be somewhere in memory, we'll see where, uh, the, uh, the, a place where these, uh, the, the address of printf is cached. And the runtime resolve will take care of finding where printf is, storing the address of uh, the printf in, at that cached printf address, and then also call the, the function. So the L runtime resolve takes two parameters. The first parameter is just a pointer to a data structure with describe, which describes the current ELF object. We'll uh, see more about that later. And the one, two, three parameter, it's uh, uh, the, an index in a table. It's an index representing a relocation. So what is a relocation? A relocation is basically a, a directive for the dynamic loader telling him, uh, so, Take this symbol, a symbol it's a, a concept that represents like a function, for instance, in a, in a library or maybe a global variable in, a, in an external library, so a symbol. Take this symbol, for instance, printf in this case, and uh, write its address at this specific address. In particular, R offset represents where the address of the symbol has to be written, and R info represents the, it's basically the identifier of uh, the, the symbol. So reloc index, which is the second parameter of the, the L runtime resolve, is an index in, the, in a table of this relocation. Basically, there is a, an, a section called RLPLT section, <coughs> which uh, is basically an array of uh, relocation uh, data structure, which, is, uh, which are called ELF-REL, which are composed of, uh, exactly by uh, error offset and error info. So every info, it's, I said that it's an identifier, but it's actually an index in another table, which is called DynSim, which is an array of, um, of symbols, structures, which are actually ELFSIM, which have a lot of details we are not interested in. The only thing we're really interested in is that there's a field called STName, which is an offset in another table, and this is the last one, I promise, uh, which is called DynStream, which is basically just the uh, concatenation of uh, the name of all the symbols that are imported from a certain from a certain binary. So to recap, basically the DL runtime resolve takes reloc index, which is an index in the real, real PLT table, which is a relocation. From the relocation, we, we pass to the symbol table, and from the symbol table, we pass to the name, which is, for in this case, uh, printf. Okay. We'll, we'll get back on these things. So. To recap again, DL runtime resolve does three things. Finds the symbol uh, and uh, its associated relocation and finds its address. So if you, from the relocation, go to the symbol and you go to the name, and from the name, the dynamic loader is able to get its address. It write, writes that address at the error offset, uh, at the address specified in error offset in the relocation, and then it also transfers the execution to that function. So it also calls it. Uh, as you might be, I uh, might have understand at this point, error offset in this case uh, will point to the address of cache of the printf address. So error offset tells, okay, right there, the, the address of this function. So next time uh, I'll call the trampoline, I won't have to resolve and get, do all the trickery to get the, uh, to resolve the symbol again and just jump straight there. It's sort of an optimization. Okay. So, uh, okay, where, where, where does this cached printf address actually stay, is? It's actually in, a, in another section which is called got PLT, which is the, it's more, mostly known as the, just the global offset table, which basically holds an entry, which is a pointer, for each imported function. So it's where these cached addresses actually are. So just to recap, we have PLT, which contains all the trampoline which en enable lazy loading. We have got PLT, where the cached address of the imported functions are stored, where basically initially they are all uninitialized, 
and they get initialized lazily from the first time you, you call that function. We have the table of relocation, which is uh, of relocations, which is rel PLT, table of symbols, which is dying sim. We have the ta and then we have the table of uh, the symbol names, which is dying string, just null terminated strings concatenated. Okay, so let's try to come up to with an attack to this to this um, system. So first, some assumptions. Our assumption, as I said, is that we are already able to divert the control flow, and we are also able to run a, a ROP chain, and we also are able to write arbitrary memory location with this ROP chain. So let's say we have a small, very small gadget which is able to say, okay, I have this address, I have this value, please write the value at that address. So very simple stuff. What can we do? So if we look at this uh, setting, the idea is, okay, what if I'm able to replace the printf string, for instance, with execv? If I'm able to do so, to replace that string, and I invoke the DL runtime result function with the uh, relocation index corresponding to printf, what the loader will do, it will go through relocation symbols, but then in the end, it will end in the dynamic string, in the dynamic string table, and it won't find printf, but it will find execv. And so it will resolve the address of exec v and also invoke that function. So we are basically, in this way, we will be able to uh, invoke any function we want just by name if we are able to write uh, this memory arbitra this arbitrary memory location. Uh, this slide is called naive approach because this approach actually does not work because there's no reason why uh, the dynamic string table should be writable. So the, the, the dynamic string table, it's not writable because it's like static information that you just write once and you never change. So this attack will not, will not work. The, even if you have this gadget, we'll try to write in a non-writable memory location and we just uh, get a seg fault. So let's try to work around this. Uh, so we talk, we've been talking about a lot of different uh, sections, but the dynamic loader actually does not go through, does not consider sections by their name. They, it doesn't look up the, I don't know, PLT, GLT section by name. It uses another section, which is called the dynamic section, which holds um, basically key value pairs where the, the key represents uh, uh, one, one of the sections it needs, and the value is its actual address. For instance, DT sim tab keeps a pointer to the dynamic symbol table. DT STR tab, a pointer to the dynamic string table, and, and so on and so forth. We're not really interested in details here, but the point is that the dynamic loader uses these, the, takes the information about the binary, about these sections, from this table. So, the nice thing is that dot dynamic section is writable. So, what we can do is, instead of trying to write directly in the dynamic string table, we can trick the loader into thinking that the dynamic string table, it's actually somewhere else. And where can we, where can we make it point? For instance, uh, we, can, we can build a fake string table in the BSS or in any other memory, any other section which is writable by us. BSS, it's typically writable, actually. It's always writable. So basically, we go to the dynamic section and we change the D value uh, field of the structure, making it point, instead of making it point to dynamic string, we make it point to BSS. So when the, what the dynamic loader will do is, okay, I'll go through relocations, symbols, and then when I'll get to the dynamic string table, instead of going to, to dot dyn string, I'll go to BSS, where I, as the attacker, I forge a fake string table, which is instead of printf as exact V. And so basically we are able to perform the attack in the sense of being able to arbor, call any function call, any library function, sorry. Okay, but this approach is still uh, quite naive because actually we're, I, we're, we were not the first people uh, thinking about this. And so the developers of uh, compilers and in particular of the linkers develop a protection called relocation read only or sh more shortly like rel room which is a binary hardening technique which prevents exactly the attack we just described. Because why, why is the, the dynamic section writable? It's simply because there are some entries that we, we did not describe yet which have to be initialized at runtime. So it has to be writable when you start your binary, but after you initialize them, you can mark that section as uh, read-only. And that's exactly what the railroad protection tells the dynamic loader to do. And so basically our previous attack doesn't work anymore but maybe we can do something else. So 
uh, we came up with another idea. So, so far we, we played with the, the, the dot dynamics section, but what can we do if we are able like to play a bit with the relocking index, the second parameter of the, the L runtime resolve? What happens if instead of making it point to an entry in the rel PLT section, in a, making it point to an existing relocation, we put an index which is big enough to go after the end of rel, uh, rel PLT section. Maybe we can uh, trick the loader into going somewhere more interesting. So let's take a look. Um, in the particular, can, can, we, can we make the loader uh, think that he has to resolve a relocation which is a me in a memory area which is writable by us? So not in rel PLT section, but maybe in BSS. So let's, let's see the, what section do we have after rel PLT. So let's suppose that we have, uh, we have some, we are usually the indexes start from the, the, the beginning of the rel PLT section, and if we put an index big enough, we can go through rel PLT, PLT, dot text, dot dynamic, dot PLT, and then we can end up in dot data and then in dot BSS. And so if you are able to trick the loader in, in, in going there and we are able to forge a fake relocation there, we can basically, uh, basically build our own relocation and resolve any library function without uh, t touching the dynamic uh, section, which is not writable. So this is us, uh, an example of the thing. So we put an, a reloc index which is big enough to not to go to real PLT, but to get into BSS where we forge a fake relocation, which points to a fake uh, symbol with the same trick. So it's the same trick. So if we start from DynSim, we put an index which is big enough to end up in BSS again. And then the same trick again with the ST name, we put an offset in the dynamic string table big enough to end up in BSS again. So basically we are building all the data, data structure which are needed by the dynamic loader to resolve a library function in the BSS and using always the same trick of overflowing the, uh, uh, like the, the, uh, the section which are supposed to, to be used, we end up in BSS and we are able again to, uh, to call any arbit uh, an arbitrary library function bypassing the, the railroad protection. So here there are just some very simple formula how to compute the addresses that we have to, to put there, uh, to, uh, in, for instance, in reloc index and in R info and in uh, ST name field to be able to perform this attack. But this, this is not that simple. Uh, this, is, this will be quite too good to be true because actually we are in, uh, the, the binary is round, in particular like in Ubuntu and several other distribution, have an, a feature which is called uh, symbol versioning, which basically allow you to uh, depend not on any printf uh, function, but on a specific version of printf. For instance, I want printf version, for, uh, a printf uh, function from the, uh, I don't know, glibc 2.22, okay. This is just an ELF fe feature, which is actually a GNU extension, but we don't really care, but since it's popular, we have to deal with it. And what's the problem? The problem is that if symbol versioning is enabled, the R info field is not used just as an index in the symbol table, but it's used also as an index in another table, which is called the GNU version table, which we'll not talk about. But the fact is that this symbol, this uh, index is used for two different things. And so basically we have additional constraints. So what we have to do in this case is either we make uh, uh, both, uh, both indexes go to the BSS section, and so we can fake also the other data structures which are related to versioning, which we'll not, we'll not look into, or we can make it point, we can make the, er ver the version uh, thing point to a zero zero somewhere in a memory area where we cannot write, like in, if, if we can find like a zero zero in text, it's fine. So we just basically, because g this just basically disable the versioning. So is it doable? Yes. And it's also, it can also be automated. The point is that there are certain situations when this is really, really hard. For instance, uh, in particular with 64-bit uh, binaries using huge pages, which, which, huge pages means that you have like uh, memory pages which can be uh, large up to a megabyte. And so basically the, uh, the, the read-only part of the binary where we have text, relocation, uh, the relocation table, the dynamic symbol table, the dynamic string table, and all these things, which is the read-only part, it's very far away. It's like one megabyte away from the writable page, okay? And so this huge distance 
makes it really hard to satisfy the constraint we just saw. And so in this case, it's not doable. The problem is that 64-bit binaries with huge pages and symbol versioning enabled are pretty popular. So we found another solution for this. The idea is the, in this case is not to, to, to play around with relock index, but with current object info. So let's look into current object info. What do we have there? Uh, it's basically a pointer to a link map structure, and we have a, this pointer. It's always stored in a reserved entry in the GOT table, which is the second one. GOT1 is the second entry of the GOT table. And the nice thing about this data structure is that it has a field called LInfo, which it basically keeps a cache of pointers to the uh, entries in the dot dynamic in the dot dynamic section so the idea is if we can tamper with this internal data structure of the loader we can basically go back to the first attack when we were tampering with directly with the dot dynamic section and this is this is actually what happens so we go to the plt got uh, section we go to the second entry which keeps a pointer to this link map structure we go to the L info field and to the, in, a, in, in, in the entry corresponding to DT STR tab, which is a pointer, which is the pointer to the dynamic entry, keeping uh, itself a pointer to the dynamic string table. We can change this value and make it point to BSS, and we can build a fake di uh, dynamic entry, which tricks again the dynamic loader into thinking that the dynamic string table is in a memory area that we control. And so we're basically falling back to the, to the first attack we saw. So we are still tampering with the dot dynamic table, but indirectly, like corrupting the internal data structure of the dynamic loader. And we can do this reliably and deterministically because the pointer to this data structure is always in the GOT one, uh, in, in the GOT, in the first, second entry of the GOT. Okay, then, uh, but still there, there's an additional protection to this because railroad, can, it, was, uh, it comes in two flavors. Partial railroad, which is the one we just saw, but then there's full railroad. Full railroad, basically, it's, um, it has all the features of partial railroad, but in addition, it uh, basically completely disables lazy loading. This means that when you start the binary, when you start your program, all the uh, GOT entries are uh, initialized, and the, the, the GOT it's marked as read, as read only. So we cannot write in the GOT anymore. And also, since they are not uh, used uh, any longer, the GOT1 uh, um, entry, which was uh, keeping the pointer to this link map structure, is not initialized. So we, are, we lost the pointer to this uh, critical data structure, which helped us to bypass partial railroad. And not only this, we also lose the pointer to the L runtime result, which is something I skip over, but uh, we, we were getting its address from the GOT2 address, and the, uh, the GOT2 entry. And also this, this, this entry is not initialized because simply lazy logging is disabled. So with these three things, we don't have a pointer to link map, we don't have a pointer to the L uh, runtime result, and we cannot write in the got. It seems like we are pretty far. <laughs> but, DT debugs to the rescue. So there is this uh, feature which is like uh, the typical, you know, debug feature which is staying there and uh, waiting for someone to abuse that. And, the, and here we are. So DT debug is an, uh, an entry of the dot dynamic table which is used by GDB and other debuggers to be able to break on, uh, on, the, on certain events related, events related to dynamic loading, like, uh, okay, we have a new library lo being loaded, you want to break so you can you know, uh, explore this library and see what new symbols you have. So debugging stuff that we don't really care about. But the nice thing is that this dynamic entry doesn't point to a section, but points to another data structure, which is air debug structure. But this air debug structure keeps a pointer to link map. So we basically are able, just passing, going through this uh, uh, debugging feature to get back to the previous attack. But it's not that simple. Because as we said, we, we also, so, so, this is the last drawing I'm showing you, I promise. <laughs> but this is really interesting, because as we said, we don't have a pointer, we have, we've, we've found a pointer to link map going through the, RT, the, the, the DT debug dynamic entry, but still we have to be able to find a pointer to the real runtime resolve. So let's do, let's see how can we make this. So let's start from this area of the drawing. So in the dot dynamic section, 
We go to DT debug, we follow its value, and we get to the air debug. From air debug, we have this field which is air map, which points to the link map structure that we saw before. So first thing we do, we corrupt the DT STR tab entry, which is the one uh, keeping a pointer to the dynamic entry uh, for the dynamic string. Okay, and so we do the the thing we just did before. We, we, we build a fake dynamic entry and we build a fake uh, string table, and this is, let's say, usual for now. But the point is that we, what, what will the dynamic loader do? Okay, it will go through all this stuff that we craft and, and it will resolve exactly, exactly, nice. But then, one of the features of the L runtime resolve, it's also storing the address of exactly in the GOT. But the GOT, it's been completely initialized and marked read only by the dynamic loader because of a full error. And so we'll get a seg fault because we are trying to write in a memory area which is read only. So we have to, um, to also to fake another entry of, uh, of the L info of the link map data structure, which is JMP rel, which is a pointer, which was the, the one holding a pointer to relocation table. So we fake also the relocation table, we create a fake relocation. Which points to an existing symbol, but as error offset, instead of pointing to the GOT, it's pointing to, like in this case, a, a memory a memory area just after it, which is writable. So we don't get the seg fault, and so we solve also this problem. Now we have one last problem, which is the address of uh, DL runtime resolve. So we don't have it in GOT uh, two, and so we have to get it somehow. But how can we get it? The trick here is that usually, actually in our survey, basically always. Only the main binary is protected with full railroad. The libraries are not protected with full railroad. So if we are able to get to the GOT of libraries, we can, get, we can still get the, DL run, the address of DL runtime resolve. And the nice thing is that the link map structure, it's not just a, a data structure per se. It's actually part of a, a linked list of all the link map data structures representing all the loaded elf objects. So basically what we can do is just we can dereference like the pointer to the next uh, to the next entry in the dynamic in the in the linked list and get to the link map data structure of just any library. For instance libc or whatever library is being loaded, we go to the uh, we get the address of the plt got got and then we go to the third entry and we get again the address of DL runtime resolve. And basically we are able to build in, building up all these things together, we are able to bypass also full railroad, which is a pretty cool thing. Okay, so, but okay, this is very, all very interesting, but how can we do that? So we implemented leakless, which is the, theme, the, the name of our tool, which implements all these techniques. You just give in the binary and the, it tells you which is the best, uh, the, actually the, all, the, 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 the approach that is most suitable for this particular binary based on the protection it has enabled and basically if it's a 64-bit with huge pages and those kind of things. And it can produce uh, two different kind of, uh, of output. It can either tell you, okay, do these things. It outputs like a JSON, uh, a JSON uh, file which basically instructs you Okay, if you are writing an exploit, write this thing there, write this thing there, and then you'll be able, to, and then just call the runtime resolve and everything will work. Or it's if you provide leakless with the uh, gadgets it needs, and we'll see what kind of gadgets it needs, it, will also, it can also produce the ROP chain for you directly. So it pr actually produces the exploit to resolve one or more functions, one after the other, and call them with the appropriate parameter. You can, uh, you can see the code there, I, on, uh, it's in GitHub, we just published it. And just, you can play around. So the gadgets, we talked about gadgets. So basically we need uh, at most four different gadgets, depending on what uh, of the four attacks I presented, excluding the first one which was not working, it was just uh, the first naive approach. Depending on which attack we are uh, dealing with, we have different gadgets that we need. So the first one, the one which was basically uh, just uh, overwriting the dot dynamic section that just needs a memory write gadget. So you give him, it's, you need a gadget, you give him an, an address, a value to write there, and it writes there. And so oh, basically all the exploits, uh, all the techniques that we saw need this kind of gadgets. So N stands for no railroad, P stands for partial railroad, H stands for when you have huge pages and all kind of stuff, and they're full, full, full railroad. 
In the other case, we have uh, slightly more sophisticated uh, gadgets. Uh, for instance, this one is, if you look at it, it's, uh, it's the one we use to tamper with data structure. So you have a pointer, which is usually a pointer to a data structure. You add an offset, you do reference it, and you write a value there. And this is uh, used um, uh, for, the, uh, for the huge pages uh, attack and for the full railroad. Full railroad has two addition, I mean, requires two additional gadgets. Uh, the, the, this one is basically a gadget that we need to store somewhere uh, some data that we took from those, like while, while we were walking to all those data structures, for instance, the uh, runtime resolve. Basically, you choose a memory area where you want to save this address, and you take it from this data structure at this offset. And in this case, so uh, I, I, I initially skipped over this, but for the first three attacks, uh, to call the L runtime result, we were using a part of the PLT, which, if you remember, it's uh, where the trampoline were. But in this case, we cannot do that because the, the L runtime result it's not initialized, and so we also need to be able to write the address of the L runtime result directly on the stack. So we need an, uh, a, a gadget which allows us to write at an offset on the stack. So we need these four gadgets. And this is also the reason why I'm here, you know, annoying you with four different techniques instead of just showing the last one, which is the most powerful one. Because depending on the protection that are enabled, you have different requirements and you need different gadgets, which might be easier or harder or maybe just take more time to, to find and implement. So, okay, but after all these, these things, what, what loaders are actually vulnerable to this? So in our, we, we tested our leakless against the, the glibc, so the GNU standard library, and against the FreeBSD standard library. But by manual inspection, we think we deem a vulnerable also dietlibc, uclibc, and newlib, which is you know, uh, embedded, uh, there are C standard libraries for embedded systems, and also OpenBSD and NetBSD. Because basically, they all, uh, they all behave like the same. If you think about it, we're just relying on the standard health features. And except for minor modifications, maybe you, you, uh, they all, for instance, they all cache pointers to the dynamic entries somehow in their internal data structures. They are maybe a bit different, but there's not, not a real big deal. We, we say that it's not vulnerable Bionic, which is the C standard library for Android, because uh, as far as I know, it does support only PIE binaries, and Musl, which is an embedded um, C standard library, because simply it does not have lazy loading. So it's like if you have full error all over the place, always. So basically, our tech is worthless. You know, it's a feature. Not having a feature, it's a feature, actually. And FreeBSD loader, I'd say it's kind of not vulnerable because the, the the, the, first, the, the first and the second, the second attack I presented you, um, basically the one which was overflowing the relocation table and symbol table and those kind of things, does not work. Because these are the only guys that are actually checking the boundaries, which is like basic two things to do, but they are the only ones. But still, the, the, the other two attacks, they do work. So it's kind of vulnerable and not vulnerable. Okay, so let's recap. What are the advantages of leakless? So first of all, it's single stage. So you don't need a memory leak vulnerability, and you don't require interaction with the victim. We, we, we are not sending back to the attacker anything. We just do a single, way, single shot exploit, which might work in, in any situation, and like air gap machine and those kind of things. So like offline attacks, which maybe before were not feasible, are now feasible. It's reliable and portable because it, it's, uh, it's deterministic. There's nothing you know, left, to the, uh, le left to randomness. or we, It's very deterministic. And then you do not need a copy of the target library. So if you think about that in the, in the beginning, I told you that you have to compute a, in, in the typical situation where you, have, you, use, you use a memory leak, you have to compute the distance between exec v and printf. But to do this, you need a copy of the library, which is not always the case. In this case, we do not care about the layout of the library. We just uh, uh, we just you, you abuse the dynamic loader, which does it in the proper way. And since it relies on just standard L feature, in most cases it's very portable and it's easy to port, for instance, to NetBSD, OpenBSD, and so forth. Except it's link map layout uh, of the, the data structure, but as I told you, there are really minor fixes to the exploit. It's short, because if you, if you want something with the same characteristic I just mentioned, like reliability and, deterministic, and being deterministic, you will need to basically re-implement what the dynamic loader is doing. So implement like in PureRop, going through all the relocation symbols and those kind of things, which is very complex. And it's also 
it, it's, it gets very long because you, it's not just to say, okay, dynamic loader, do this for me. You have to do it by yourself. And also the advantage of leakless is that once you set up all the data structures, if you want to make multiple calls to different library functions, you just need to, after you did the first one, you just need to change the name of the function you want to call and just call again the L runtime result. Instead, if you want to implement the dynamic loader, you have to do again all the process. And so it's, it's a cause that is not negligible. And you know, shorter, shorter rob chains mean higher, higher feasibility. You know? Sometimes buffers are small and you have limits. And if you don't want uh, to interact again, you cannot read. You know? it's, if you want to do it single stage, being short is important. Uh, we, we also see, say that it's stealthy because basically we are not, the, the typical uh, criticism one could make to the, such an attack is that, okay, but why don't you just do this with syscalls? Okay? Because first of all, syscalls might not be available. They're, you might not have them in the binary, like even in misalign. But it's also more invasive. Because for instance, you can always do, you, if you can do syscall, you can basically do everything you want. But it might, you might have an uh, intrusion detection system and also spawning a, pro, a new process, for instance, if you want to do exactly, it's kind of invasive. And here is an example of a uh, thing we came up with. It's a, um, it's a C pseudo code for using um, uh, pidgin functions. Pidgin is an IM, IM client. And so what we're doing here is we're taking the, uh, the, uh, the pointer to the, to the proxy object uh, of pidgin and we are setting, so the, the attack we want to carry on is like, okay, set a proxy uh, for, so I can intercept the instant messaging traffic for this user. So what we do is we take the global object for in proxy, we send a proxy which is our server, the port, the type, and then we connect and disconnect the user. Sure, you can do this also with Cisco somehow, but reusing a program functionality, it's much easier and it's less intrusive, and it's also easier. And also it's automated. By, and by this mean that our tool basically does almost everything except finding the gadgets. But maybe in the future we can integrate it with some automated gadget finding tool. So, Countermeasures, well, the, the most obvious countermeasure is, is uh, in, uh, enabling PIE, so uh, randomizing also the position of the main binary, okay? This, this is, a, a, is an actual solution, but actually in our survey there are like very, very, it, it's, uh, PIE is not being deployed a lot. It's, uh, the distribution basically use it in, on bin binaries, they deem critical. I don't know why they don't, don't they deploy it on all the binaries, it doesn't make sense to me, but this is a possible solution. Also, DTDBug, why should it be there? Just remove it, or maybe uh, use it, enable it only if there is like exp an exported um, vari variable if you want, like an environment variable if you want to do debug, then you can, uh, you can enable it. Or you can make, try to make the lo dynamic loader data structure read only, so if you try to tamper with them, you get a crash. Or just validate the input is also a very good countermeasure. But the, the key point is that this kind of core, um, core components of the operating system should be retold with security in mind because basically the, all the, the libraries we inspected were just trusting the user input. And since they are all over the place, you are, it's, very, it's uh, very dangerous because if you're, if you're able to uh, attack them, you are able to obtain something that is very portable and it's uh, all over the place. So also ELF maybe should be redesigned a bit with security in mind from the beginning. And this last thing, I want to thank all the other people who work between me, with me in this, like Amat, which is here, and Jan, which is not here, and Giovanni and Christopher at UCSB, which allowed me to be here. And that's basically all. Maybe I have a second to do a very short, so just to show you some code. So this is, uh, I'm just going, uh, we tried uh, to implement, it, to attack a real binary because you know, we have a small twist test suite in leakless, but we also want to do something real. So we took a CV in, uh, in Wireshark, just a very basic stack uh, overflow, I mean a stack buffer overflow. And we tried to generate an exploit with, uh, with leakless, um, just providing it with the gadgets. Oh, just a small demo. We launch it, this is just an error because I'm running Wireshark as root, don't do that. It's a very bad idea. <laughs> we launch it passing, passing a pickup which I generated and I got a shell. So, it's, it, it's pretty easy. Yeah. Shell are always good. 
Yeah, and then we have the same with partial revenue, but you know, it's the same experience for you, so just trust me. So uh, the last thing, this is the, the part, is, uh, leakless has been implemented in Python, and this is the code to, that you need to write if you want to provide gadgets to them, to, do, to leakless, and it's 200 lines of code, but most of them it's just boilerplate that could be uh, you know, factorized out, and it's basically just, uh, take the gadgets and mix them together so they can be reused by the, let, let's say, the part of leakless which is agnostic from the binary. And last thing is, uh, yeah, I just wanted to show you the, the JSON output. Let me see. So this, uh, this dot uh, exploit dot pi, uh, dot pi it's, our, it's basically the leakless script. We pass it the Wireshark binary, and we ask him to produce the exploit in JSON format using the LD corrupt uh, method, which is uh, the second one I presented. And what it does, it basically gives us some instructions like, OK, write uh, these things at this address. And so if you don't want the, the, the ROP chain to be generated automatically for it, because maybe you have some complicated setting, it can just give you the uh, instruction to perform the, the attack. Uh, with this, I'm done, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>